Chapter 29 Satan's Enmity Against the Law The very first effort of Satan to overthrow God's law, undertaken among the sinless inhabitants of heaven, seemed for a time to be crowned with success. A vast number of the angels were seduced, but Satan's apparent triumph resulted in defeat and loss, separation from God, and banishment from heaven. When the conflict was renewed upon the earth, Satan again won a seeming advantage. By transgression, man became his captive, and man's kingdom also was betrayed into the hands of the arch-rebel. Now the way seemed open for Satan to establish an independent kingdom and to defy the authority of God and his Son. But the plan of salvation made it possible for man again to be brought into harmony with God and to render obedience to his law, and for both man and the earth to be finally redeemed from the power of the wicked one. Again Satan was defeated, and again he resorted to deception in the hope of converting his defeat into a victory. To stir up rebellion in the fallen race, he now represented God as unjust in having permitted man to transgress his law. Why, said the artful tempter, when God knew what would be the result, did he permit man to be placed on trial, to sin, and bring in misery and death? The children of Adam, forgetful of the long-suffering mercy that had granted man another trial, regardless of the amazing, the awful sacrifice which his rebellion had cost the King of Heaven, gave ear to the tempter, and murmured against the holy being who could save them from the destructive power of Satan. There are thousands today echoing the same rebellious complaint against God. They do not see that to deprive man of the freedom of choice would be to rob him of his prerogative as an intelligent being and make him a mere automaton. It is not God's purpose to coerce the will. Man was created a free moral agent. Like the inhabitants of all other worlds, he must be subjected to the test of obedience. But he is never brought into such a position that yielding to evil becomes a matter of necessity. No temptation or trial is permitted to come to him which he is unable to resist. God made such ample provision that man need never have been defeated in the conflict with Satan. As men increased upon the earth, almost the whole world joined the ranks of rebellion. Once more Satan seemed to have gained the victory. But Omnipotent power again cut short the working of iniquity, and the earth was cleansed by the flood from its moral pollution. Says the prophet, When thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness, and will not behold the majesty of Jehovah. Isaiah chapter 26, verses 9 and 10. Thus it was after the flood. Released from his judgments, the inhabitants of the earth again rebelled against the Lord. Twice God's covenant and his statutes had been rejected by the world. Both the people before the flood and the descendants of Noah cast off the divine authority. Then God entered into covenant with Abraham and took to himself a people to become the depositaries of his law. To seduce and destroy this people, Satan began at once to lay his snares. The children of Jacob were tempted to contract marriages with the heathen and to worship their idols. But Joseph was faithful to God, and his fidelity was a constant testimony to the true faith. It was to quench this light that Satan worked through the envy of Joseph's brothers to cause him to be sold as a slave in a heathen land. God overruled events, however, so that the knowledge of himself should be given to the people of Egypt. Both in the house of Potiphar and in the prison, Joseph received an education and training that, with the fear of God, prepared him for his high position as prime minister of the nation. From the palace of the Pharaohs, his influence was felt throughout the land, and the knowledge of God spread far and wide. The Israelites in Egypt also became prosperous and wealthy, and such as were true to God exerted a widespread influence. 
The idolatrous priests were filled with alarm as they saw the new religion finding favor. Inspired by Satan, with his own enmity toward the God of heaven, they set themselves to quench the light. To the priests was committed the education of the heir to the throne, and it was this spirit of determined opposition to God and zeal for idolatry that molded the character of the future monarch and led to cruelty and oppression toward the Hebrews. During the forty years after the flight of Moses from Egypt, idolatry seemed to have conquered. Year by year the hopes of the Israelites grew fainter. Both king and people exulted in their power and mocked the God of Israel. This grew until it culminated in the Pharaoh who was confronted by Moses. When the Hebrew leader came before the king with a message from Jehovah, God of Israel, it was not ignorance of the true God, but defiance of his power that prompted the answer, Who is Jehovah, that I should obey his voice? I know not Jehovah. From first to last, Pharaoh's opposition to the divine command was not the result of ignorance, but of hatred and defiance. Though the Egyptians had so long rejected the knowledge of God, the Lord still gave them opportunity for repentance. In the days of Joseph, Egypt had been an asylum for Israel. God had been honored in the kindness shown his people, and now the long-suffering one, slow to anger and full of compassion, gave each judgment time to do its work. The Egyptians, cursed through the very objects they had worshipped, had evidence of the power of Jehovah, and all who would might submit to God and escape his judgments. The bigotry and stubbornness of the king resulted in spreading the knowledge of God, and bringing many of the Egyptians to give themselves to his service. It was because the Israelites were so disposed to connect themselves with the heathen and imitate their idolatry that God had permitted them to go down into Egypt, where the influence of Joseph was widely felt, and where circumstances were favorable for them to remain a distinct people. Here also the gross idolatry of the Egyptians and their cruelty and oppression during the latter part of the Hebrew sojourn should have inspired in them an abhorrence of idolatry, and should have led them to flee for refuge to the God of their fathers. This very providence Satan made a means to serve his purpose, darkening the minds of the Israelites, and leading them to imitate the practices of their heathen masters. On account of the superstitious veneration in which animals were held by the Egyptians, the Hebrews were not permitted during their bondage to present the sacrificial offerings. Thus their minds were not directed by this service to the great sacrifice, and their faith was weakened. When the time came for Israel's deliverance, Satan set himself to resist the purposes of God. It was his determination that that great people, numbering more than two million souls, should be held in ignorance and superstition. The people whom God had promised to bless and multiply, to make a power in the earth, and through whom he was to reveal the knowledge of his will, the people whom he was to make the keepers of his law, this very people Satan was seeking to keep in obscurity and bondage, that he might obliterate from their minds the remembrance of God. When the miracles were wrought before the king, Satan was on the ground to counteract their influence and prevent Pharaoh from acknowledging the supremacy of God and obeying his mandate. Satan wrought to the utmost of his power to counterfeit the work of God and resist his will. The only result was to prepare the way for greater exhibitions of the divine power and glory, and to make more apparent, both to the Israelites and to all Egypt, the existence and sovereignty of the true and living God. God delivered Israel with the mighty manifestations of his power and with judgments upon all the gods of Egypt. He brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Psalm 105, verses 43 to 45. He rescued them from their servile state, that he might bring them to a good land, a land which in his providence had been prepared for them as a refuge from their enemies, where they might dwell under the shadow of his wings. He would bring them to himself, and encircle them in his everlasting arms, and in return for all his goodness and mercy to them, 
they were required to have no other gods before him, the living God, and to exalt his name and to make it glorious in the earth. During the bondage in Egypt, many of the Israelites had, to a great extent, lost the knowledge of God's law and had mingled its precepts with heathen customs and traditions. God brought them to Sinai, and there with his own voice declared his law. Satan and evil angels were on the ground. Even while God was proclaiming his law to his people, Satan was plotting to tempt them to sin. This people whom God had chosen, he would wrench away in the very face of heaven. By leading them into idolatry, he would destroy the efficacy of all worship. For how can man be elevated by adoring what is no higher than himself, and may be symbolized by his own handiwork? If men could become so blinded to the power, the majesty, and the glory of the infinite God, as to represent him by a graven image, or even by a beast or reptile, if they could so forget their own divine relationship, formed in the image of their Maker, as to bow down to these revolting and senseless objects, then the way was open for foul license. The evil passions of the heart would be unrestrained, and Satan would have full sway. At the very foot of Sinai, Satan began to execute his plans for overthrowing the law of God, thus carrying forward the same work he had begun in heaven. During the forty days while Moses was in the mount with God, Satan was busy exciting doubt, apostasy, and rebellion. While God was writing down his law to be committed to his covenant people, the Israelites, denying their loyalty to Jehovah, were demanding gods of gold. When Moses came from the awful presence of the divine glory, with the precepts of the law which they had pledged themselves to obey, he found them in open defiance of its commands, bowing in adoration before a golden image. By leading Israel to this daring insult and blasphemy to Jehovah, Satan had planned to cause their ruin. Since they had proved themselves to be so utterly degraded, so lost to all sense of the privileges and blessings that God had offered them, and to their own solemn and repeated pledges of loyalty, the Lord would, he believed, divorce them from himself and devote them to destruction. Thus would be secured the extinction of the seed of Abraham, that seed of promise that was to preserve the knowledge of the living God, and through whom he was to come, the true seed that was to conquer Satan. The great rebel had planned to destroy Israel, and thus thwart the purposes of God. But again he was defeated. Sinful as they were, the people of Israel were not destroyed. While those who stubbornly ranged themselves on the side of Satan were cut off, the people, humbled and repentant, were mercifully pardoned. The history of this sin was to stand as a perpetual testimony to the guilt and punishment of idolatry, and the justice and long-suffering mercy of God. The whole universe had been witness to the scenes at Sinai. In the working out of the two administrations was seen the contrast between the government of God and that of Satan. Again, the sinless inhabitants of other worlds beheld the results of Satan's apostasy and the kind of government that he would have established in heaven had he been permitted to bear sway. By causing men to violate the second commandment, Satan aimed to degrade their conceptions of the divine being. By setting aside the fourth, he would cause them to forget God altogether. God's claim to reverence and worship above the gods of the heathen is based upon the fact that he is the creator, and that to him all other beings owe their existence. Thus it is presented in the Bible. Says the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord is the true God, He is the living God, and an everlasting King. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth, and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by His power, He hath established the world by His wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by His discretion. Every man is brutish in his knowledge, every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. 
They are vanity and the work of errors. In the time of their visitation they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 10 to 12, and verses 14 to 16. The Sabbath, as a memorial of God's creative power, points to him as the maker of the heavens and the earth. Hence, it is a constant witness to his existence and a reminder of his greatness, his wisdom, and his love. Had the Sabbath always been sacredly observed, there could never have been an atheist or an idolater. The Sabbath institution, which originated in Eden, is as old as the world itself. It was observed by all the patriarchs from creation down. During the bondage in Egypt, the Israelites were forced by their taskmasters to violate the Sabbath, and to a great extent they lost the knowledge of its sacredness. When the law was proclaimed at Sinai, the very first words of the fourth commandment were, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, showing that the Sabbath was not then instituted. We are pointed back for its origin to creation. In order to obliterate God from the minds of men, Satan aimed to tear down this great memorial. If men could be led to forget their Creator, they would make no effort to resist the power of evil, and Satan would be sure of his prey. Satan's enmity against God's law had impelled him to war against every precept of the Decalogue. To the great principle of love and loyalty to God, the Father of all, the principle of filial love and obedience is closely related. Contempt for parental authority will soon lead to contempt for the authority of God. Hence Satan's efforts to lessen the obligation of the fifth commandment. Among heathen peoples, the principle enjoined in this precept was little heeded. In many nations, parents were abandoned or put to death as soon as age had rendered them incapable of providing for themselves. In the family, the mother was treated with little respect, and upon the death of her husband, she was required to submit to the authority of her eldest son. Filial obedience was enjoined by Moses, but as the Israelites departed from the Lord, the fifth commandment, with others, came to be disregarded. Satan was a murderer from the beginning, John chapter 8, verse 44. And as soon as he had obtained power over the human race, he not only prompted them to hate and slay one another, but, the more boldly to defy the authority of God, he made the violation of the sixth commandment a part of their religion. By perverted conceptions of divine attributes, heathen nations were led to believe human sacrifices necessary to secure the favor of their deities, and the most horrible cruelties have been perpetrated under the various forms of idolatry. Among these was the practice of causing their children to pass through the fire before their idols. When one of them came through this ordeal unharmed, the people believed that their offsprings were accepted. The one thus delivered was regarded as specially favored by the gods, was loaded with benefits, and ever afterward held in high esteem. And however aggravated his crimes, he was never punished. But should one be burned in passing through the fire, his fate was sealed. It was believed that the anger of the gods could be appeased only by taking the life of the victim, and he was accordingly offered as a sacrifice. In times of great apostasy, these abominations prevailed, to some extent, among the Israelites. The violation of the seventh commandment also was early practiced in the name of religion. The most licentious and abominable rites were made a part of the heathen worship. The gods themselves were represented as impure, and their worshipers gave the rein to the baser passions. Unnatural vices prevailed, and the religious festivals were characterized by universal and open impurity. Polygamy was practiced at an early date. It was one of the sins that brought the wrath of God upon the antediluvian world. Yet, after the flood, it again became widespread. It was Satan's studied effort to pervert the marriage institution, to weaken its obligations and lessen its sacredness. For in no surer way could he deface the image of God in man and open the door to misery and vice. 
From the opening of the great controversy, it has been Satan's purpose to misrepresent God's character and to excite rebellion against his law, and this work appears to be crowned with success. The multitudes give ear to Satan's deceptions and set themselves against God. But amid the working of evil, God's purposes move steadily forward to their accomplishment. To all created intelligences, he is making manifest his justice and benevolence. Through Satan's temptations, the whole human race have become transgressors of God's law. But by the sacrifice of his Son, a way is opened whereby they may return to God. Through the grace of Christ, they may be enabled to render obedience to the Father's law. Thus, in every age, from the midst of apostasy and rebellion, God gathers out a people that are true to him, a people in whose heart is his law. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 7. It was by deception that Satan seduced angels. Thus he has in all ages carried forward his work among men, and he will continue this policy to the last. Should he openly profess to be warring against God and his law, men would beware. But he disguises himself and mixes truth with error. The most dangerous falsehoods are those that are mingled with truth. It is thus that errors are received that captivate and ruin the soul. By this means, Satan carries the world with him. But a day is coming when his triumph will be forever ended. God's dealings with rebellion will result in fully unmasking the work that has so long been carried on under cover. The results of Satan's rule, the fruits of setting aside the divine statutes, will be laid open to the view of all created intelligences. The law of God will stand fully vindicated. It will be seen that all the dealings of God have been conducted with reference to the eternal good of his people and the good of all the worlds that he has created. Satan himself, in the presence of the witnessing universe, will confess the justice of God's government and the righteousness of his law. The time is not far distant when God will arise to vindicate his insulted authority. The Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 21. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? Malachi chapter 3, verse 2. The people of Israel, because of their sinfulness, were forbidden to approach the mount when God was about to descend upon it to proclaim his law, lest they should be consumed by the burning glory of his presence. If such manifestations of his power marked the place chosen for the proclamation of God's law, how terrible must be his tribunal when he comes for the execution of these sacred statutes? How will those who have trampled upon his authority endure his glory in the great day of final retribution? The terrors of Sinai were to represent to the people the scenes of the judgment. The sound of a trumpet summoned Israel to meet with God. The voice of the archangel and the trump of God shall summon from the whole earth both the living and the dead to the presence of their judge. The Father and the Son, attended by a multitude of angels, were present upon the mount. At the great judgment day, Christ will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. He shall then sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations. When the divine presence was manifested upon Sinai, the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire in the sight of all Israel. But when Christ shall come in glory with his holy angels, the whole earth shall be ablaze with the terrible light of his presence. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Psalm 50, verses 3 and 4. A fiery stream shall issue and come forth from before him, which shall cause the elements to melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. 
Never since man was created had there been witnessed such a manifestation of divine power as when the law was proclaimed from Sinai. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Psalm 68, verse 8. Amid the most terrific convulsions of nature, the voice of God like a trumpet was heard from the cloud. The mountain was shaken from base to summit, and the hosts of Israel, pale and trembling with terror, lay upon their faces upon the earth. He whose voice then shook the earth has declared, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26. Says the scripture, the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 30, and Joel chapter 3, verse 16. In that great coming day, the heaven itself shall depart as a scroll when it is rolled together. Revelation chapter 6, verse 14. And every mountain and island shall be moved out of its place. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Isaiah chapter 24, verse 20. Therefore shall all hands be faint, all faces shall be turned into paleness, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. And I will punish the world for their evil, saith the Lord, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Isaiah chapter 13, verses 7, 8, and 11, and Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 6. When Moses came from the divine presence in the mount, where he had received the tables of the testimony, guilty Israel could not endure the light that glorified his countenance. How much less can transgressors look upon the Son of God when he shall appear in the glory of his Father, surrounded by all the heavenly hosts, to execute judgment upon the transgressors of his law and the rejecters of his atonement? Those who have disregarded the law of God and trodden underfoot the blood of Christ, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men shall hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and they shall say to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 to 17. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks, and into the tops of the ragged rocks, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake terribly the earth. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Then it will be seen that Satan's rebellion against God has resulted in ruin to himself and to all that chose to become his subjects. He has represented that great good would result from transgression, but it will be seen that the wages of sin is death. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. Satan, the root of every sin, and all evil workers, who are his branches, shall be utterly cut off. An end will be made of sin, with all the woe and ruin that have resulted from it. Says the psalmist, Thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name for ever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. Psalm 9, verses 5 and 6. But amid the tempest of divine judgment, the children of God will have no cause for fear. The Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Joel chapter 3, verse 16. The day that brings terror and destruction to the transgressors of God's law will bring to the obedient joy unspeakable and full of glory. Gather my saints together unto me, saith the Lord, 
those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Then shall ye return, and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Malachi chapter 3, verse 18. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling. Thou shalt no more drink it again. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Isaiah chapter 51, verses 7, 22, and 12. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. The great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be the eternal abode of the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now, God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Daniel chapter 7, verse 18. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Psalm 113, verse 3. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. And Jehovah shall be king over all the earth. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. Says the scripture, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. Psalms 119, verse 89, and 111, verses 7 and 8. The sacred statutes which Satan has hated and sought to destroy will be honored throughout a sinless universe. And as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 11.